An extraordinary party for an unusual couple, for Shazia Zuberi from a Pakistani family and Henderson Leacock, a black man, this is the first of their marriage ceremonies. <laughs> Two people with very different backgrounds will become one Canadian family. But from this day on, Canadian racial attitudes will affect their family life. The children they hope to raise will struggle to piece together an identity. Their children may someday choose to see themselves as Pakistani or black or neither. These choices will be shaped by attitudes on the street and attitudes inside the Zuberi and Leacock families. And among the two families joined here, all does not appear to be well from the start. Later at the wedding and reception, Henderson's family is out in force along with the newlyweds' friends. But Shazia's aunt and uncle are the only Zuberis who would attend. The newlyweds already carry a burden shared by thousands of interracial couples in Canada. They will fight harder for a dignified future. It might console the couple to know that that future has already been lived by other families across Canada. Each has achieved a unique and delicate balancing act. Sunit John's roots are in colonial India, his education English and Christian. He came to Canada in 1960 wanting to assimilate and he was good at it. Even then, he probably did not expect to meet and marry his wife Lynn. It was one further step away from his origin. Yet cultural give and take remains a feature of the John family life. Before the couple married in 1972, Lynn had almost no contact with people of colour. Now in Toronto, they have three mixed-race children. Each has a different strategy for bridging the gaps. Their children, Miriam, Matthew and Daniel, started to work out who they were from an early age. One time, when I was little, coming home from school, and I think it was after I'd been to somebody's house for lunch, and I said to my mom, you know, why didn't you eat curry? Because I, you know, I realized that, you know, my friend didn't eat curry. And she said, well, it's because your dad's Indian. And I said, oh, I guess that means we're half Indian and half normal. And that became like a really big family joke and gets me told that every family party you ever go to. And when she said that, I thought, first of all, it was hilarious and funny. And uh, I wondered if uh, she can conceive of herself as half Indian and half normal, what that left my husband. But about a year later, when we were driving in the car, my husband and I and Miriam said to us, it's a Pakistan. So I explained to her that it was something from Pakistan. Then I thought, to him, why did you ask me that? So, she said somebody called it Pakistan in the schoolyard. I would never even admit to somebody that I e ever ate curry because I used to I remember hearing how much they used to tease Mansoor. Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They say Mansoor smells like a sewer and all this uh -huh. stuff because you know he smelled like curry. So I just I remember hearing that and thinking, oh man, I better never let it slip. <laughs> <laughs> I hate curry when I was a kid. All of Sunit's siblings married white Canadians and family picnics are a multiracial jumble of bodies. The racial hierarchy of everyday Canadian life may not disappear, but here life is more comfortable. I can't serve. Here too, the children will look around for the signals about who they might be. Some will try to be as white as possible. Some will resent their difference. And some will celebrate it. <laughs> the John children are still working at ways to fold their Indianness into a life like that of their peers. It's an individual journey and the family can only be of so much help. 
it's harder if that family's consciousness of its roots is already fading. We have a lot of family around us. Though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they're not very Indian either, though. Yeah. Like, yeah, they don't know much about yeah. India either, so... Well, they're not, well, it does. Yeah, I don't know, except for grandma, but no, not... And Aunt Yavi and stuff like that. When I was growing up, it was different from you two, because I had this complex about being white. I wanted to be white. I wanted to have blonde hair, blue eyes, and be like everybody else in the class. I got teased, too. Like, you know, I got called passive yeah. and stuff. Oh, like, nobody, nobody ever teased me when I was in school. Yeah. Even, like, all the way up. I don't remember ever being called names. Mm -hmm. Matt's like the least Indian of all. I'm a baby Indian. <laughs> He's the lighter skin, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew's skin color is remarkable inside his family, and outside it allows him to most easily follow his father's strategy of assimilation. Matthew, above all, wants to lead a Canadian life. His politics are Ontario Progressive Conservatives. He organizes for the party at the University of Toronto's Scarborough campus. He shares his father's confident expectation that he will be accepted. He sees himself headed forward and upward with no deep fear that he will be denied anything because of his race. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> How much is that? Following this path has made Matthew himself a target for family humor. Jokes that are both political and racial. Oh, he's always like having somebody like that too. Yeah, we do actually. Yeah. Have to admit. Like minorities and poor people. Oh. 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 That was a low blow. Of course, realizing that I am a minority myself. Right. Well, hey. uh, You're right. <laughs> and then the conversation. No, no, the no, conservative says that we're white. I mean, right. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is not true, Uncle. I'm not white. Yeah, you are. The way you behave. Camille Hernandez Ramos is born in 1994. Born of Ukrainian and Trinidadian parents, cannot adopt Matthew John's confidence. She knows everyday racism and wants to protect her children from it in a way her parents were not able to do. It was an earlier, harder time for interracial couples and their children. I, I was left pretty much on my own to develop a racial identity um, because my parents weren't giving me any sort of support or any sort of guidance in that area. And uh, at school, I was just surrounded by white kids and, you know, I mean, they saw me as different, I got called names or whatever, but. I also, at a very, I guess, fairly young age, well, around 12, I really realized I am not one of these people. I'm different. There's something different about me. It's then that I started to explore um, different racial identities. And I think I went through different processes, uh, looking for something that fit. What really sort of spoke to me was, was black identity. That just made a lot of sense to me. That's how I felt. Um, and that's also how I was being seen. And as I got a little older, I started to realize it was also Caribbean. Even to define as a Caribbean person is sort of an ambiguous position to be in. People still want you to give some kind of racial definition. Um, so this is, you know, sort of where I find myself at this particular point, and I, I feel I really have to define as a multiracial person. Camille's partner, Trevor, is also from a mixed-race background. Their shared experiences have already eliminated a potential source of family trouble. Some things are taken for granted. I had an extended family that was very mixed. So, to me, when I go to my cousins, they never look like me. They look different. Some, they all look different. Mm -hmm. But an identity inside a family may not easily be found outside it. There, society imposes its own requirements. Um, I think identity is a very subjective, very personal thing, and I think you have to find the balance between what you truly feel yourself to be, you know, outside of heredity and, and social socialization and things, and also how society sees you. There's actually a term for it, it's called perceptual dissonance between how we see ourselves and how the world sees us. And I think a lot of multiracial people go through this. I mean, I, I know I go through it almost daily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I tell people in my cousin, like one my cousin, like Richard, yeah. he comes to my office sometimes, right? <laughs> you know? And I say, my cousin's going to come pick up this parcel and we'll give it to him, right? You just, so now, I forgot to say about what he looks like physically. Like, oh, he's a big fat, he's big and he's bald, right? And he's going to come and pick up. You know, 
So Richard comes to the thing, and of course he's black, and he's bald, and he's big, right? <laughs> and then and he said, he said um, Trevor left something here for me, his name's Richard. And then they leave, and then they come back. You see your cousin? You know, yeah. Even yeah. though he, he sounds the same, he also sounds yeah. Chinese. You know, that's what, you just can't make yeah. that connection. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Kimiko Hota has faced similar situations. Multiracial children can look remarkably different from their parents. For her, this contrast was driven home early. When I was a young child, when I used to go to the playground with my mother, children used to always say things to me like, that's not your real mother. My mother's a strawberry blonde with blue eyes and uh, very, very fair. And I used to always say, yes, of course, that's my real mother. But I had a, a funny feeling about it. I, I, I often um, used to think that maybe I was adopted. Um, it wasn't until I studied uh, biology later on that I, I understood how it could be that I could look so different from my mother, that I was actually a real mixture of, of my father's, um, how my father looked and how my mother looked. Kameko teaches English to people who are facing an even tougher cultural reality than hers. Her students are people who are taking a step away from their ethnic roots. But as she gets older, she has investigated more closely her father's Japanese roots. She lived in Japan. She learned her family's history there and on this continent. But before that, she changed her name. I was born with the name Kimberly Denise Hota and um, it was a name uh, when I was growing up people always referred to me as Kim um, it was a name that I didn't really identify with uh, Kim, Kimberly's a Gaelic name, Denise is a French name I didn't feel very much that that really reflected who I was when I finally did change my name was I went overseas to school in Switzerland and I just enrolled as Kimiko and so it was really from the age of 18 that I started to go by that name but it wasn't until I finished university that I legally changed my name and I feel really really good about having done that my grandparents changed their names uh, they had beautiful Japanese names my grandmother was Yoshiko Nakamura and my grandfather was Takashi Hota but they changed their names to George and Rosie so I, I just thought there's some justice in, in changing my name back to being Japanese. My experiences in Japan were a bit different than what I might have expected before I went over. Um, I found that, I guess I was expected to go over there and be accepted as Japanese, but I found that I was, I was uh, treated as an exotic Canadian, which really quite surprised me initially. Um, in Canada, I think most people look at me and they think I look very Asian. In Japan, they thought I looked very Caucasian. So in Canada, people might say that I look like my father, but the Japanese people thought that I looked like my mother. For Matthew John, the biggest problem is simple racial hatred. He is shocked into a consciousness of his background only by other people's racism and his parents' difficulty in helping him deal with that racism. I never really felt like I was different until I think I was 17 years old and I went to pick up one of a girl to go, in a, go to the library with her or something and I was standing in the hallway where her father couldn't see me and she, he asked her where are you going and she said I'm going out with Matthew and he said you're going out with that nigger again he's going to get you killed I see that kind of thing on TV or it was something to that effect but I remember he called me a nigger and uh, I was just so completely shocked that I just walked out of the house and I, I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to think. I didn't understand and know exactly what had been said. And so I, I think I just, uh, as I did in all situations, um, tried to understand where that father was coming from. One of the things I remember, if I, uh, I'm pretty sure I remember this, um, e emphasizing the matter of you, you've got to start at the place of forgiving him before you can actually work this out and resolve uh, handling your own anger. I don't know, it would have been like some kind of, I don't know, I don't even know what they could have done, but some kind of advice or something. <laughs> you know, because it was like, 
It was like the first time I really felt, you know, that somebody's making me feel different. I know for a fact that if like I ever dated another girl whose family was opposed to me dating her, I would not, I wouldn't go through the trouble of, of even trying. I wouldn't bother. I'd say, forget it. It's not worth it. Okay. You know, you go find somebody who's your own race, your parents will love because like, I'm not going to go through that again. I don't need that kind of grief, right? I grew up in Winnipeg and what I remember, I guess, most clearly is that um, experiencing a lot of racism at the school that I went to and coming home and wanting some kind of support or explanation for these names I was being called, I was being called nigger a lot. Um, and what I got instead was just a sort of a silence, a, a, a blank wall. Um, my father was in a lot of denial and so he didn't want to deal with these issues. And my mother was, um, you know, had no experience of racism and had no understanding of what I was going through, so she was silent. Camille will not ignore the racism in her children's lives and will be actively involved in their dealings with it. In her view, mothers have a crucial role to play. Mothers tend to be the ones that insult, instill cultures in children. And I think if the mother is a person of color, as opposed to the father, and the mother is the one who is doing most of the nursing and the raising of that child and the educating of that child, social educating, that a mixed child with a mother of color is going to have a different kind of development than a, than a child whose father is a person of color. One thing, you know, that I, that I said, okay, I'm never going to do this next week. I'm never going to pretend that racism doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to pretend that, that there's not differences between myself and my children because, um, you know, my children don't necessarily look the way I look. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I may have already experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, children asking me, you know, am I the good mother? You know, I'm kind of looking at me strangely because I don't, I don't look like him. Camille's children are growing up with the kinds of support their mother did not have. There is more discussion of racism, more advice about how to handle it. But her son Louis still faces it. He's aware of racism, but for him, his own self, how he's making sense of who he is and how he fits into the world, mm -hmm. is, is, is not necessarily the same thing as all these things that, that mom has told him that he's grown up hearing about. You know, that's kind of like stuff you might know about historically, like uh, the history of our family or the history of colonialism and the history of racism in Canada and, you know, First Nations people and all this kind of stuff. And, yeah, he's well aware of that. But then to take that then and integrate that into, well, who, who am I? How do I fit into this story? But for him personally, the, the thing is, is what, how he perceives himself. It's not, yeah, it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't matter how people perceive him once he's sure about how he perceives himself. Mm -hmm. And then it wouldn't matter what people think. For the newlyweds, Shazia and Henderson, only one family can be called upon to help build that confidence. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> my parents had reacted to her in a very positive way from day one. They accepted her for who she was. Um, they didn't really pay attention as to her religious background. Yeah. 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 Shazia's family has still not accepted her marriage. My dad was very shocked and he was very upset. My mother was also very upset. And then if I choose to do this, then I should be on my own. Like if I if I go this route then it won't be it will be without their support. And you know what? Her family's refusal to accept her husband has revealed family attitudes that will haunt their marriage perhaps for years to come. Shazia's aunt Zora knew it would be a problem from the start. When our community learned about um, Shazia intending to marry Henderson, it was more like, can you believe that? A Pakistani girl, mm. the Barry girl, is marrying a guy from Barbados? It was a no-no. Zora was not surprised at the family's response. South Asian prejudices were emerging. It's an unfortunate fact of life that most South Asians have double standards in that respect. They can complain endlessly about, about uh, discrimination against themselves, but when it comes to, um, particularly when it comes to darker races, they are very, very discriminating. At least I find that one of the most discriminating communities. 
I felt the entire community, community feels that anyone that's outside the community is basically shouldn't be married inside. Now they say that a lot of them would say that no, I'm not racist, or that you know, oh well, I have brown skin just like you have, and look, I'm the same as you. But I truly feel that when they look at anyone else different, especially myself being black, they kind of look down and frown upon that, that they kind of put themselves on a higher level as me. Um, whereas, like the Pakistanis, like people would walk down the street when the young fellow look at that pack over there, they're, they're showing the same sort of racism towards me as not, a, as, and not accepting me as a person. Like all mixed-race children, Kimiko Hota, her brother John, and their cousin Sarah have all been challenged to construct an identity. For John, it was in some ways the toughest. My Asian uh, grandparents would, would say I look white, and my white grandparents say I look Asian. It was yeah. sort of even hard to find my own identity because no one else really knows my identity. Yeah, yeah. I found that in Canada I've been seen as Asian, but when I went to Japan, yeah. people saw me as white. To the family, John looks the least Asian of the Hatta children. Elsewhere, there is a frequent subtle tension as people try to place him in the racial spectrum. And it's always like you give an exotic look to your face or, or they look in something, trying not to make it too obvious what they're after. Sometimes I just like to uh, give them a hard time and tell them that I'm Canadian. <laughs> and ask where my parents are from. I say from Canada, your grandparents Canada, just to sort of I guess I just get tired of uh, getting asked the same questions over and over again about where I'm from. And sometimes that's annoying, but I guess if they wanted to know, just to sort of get an idea of what I'm about, then I don't mind. But I see what you mean, but yeah. most times I'm not offended by that. Um, people uh, keep asking us until, and, until they get to the questions around food and martial mm -hmm. arts martial and yeah. all of that. Yeah. But, but what, the reason that they're asking has to do with race because they're looking at us and they're seeing race. But the questions that they're asking us are questions of culture. But we're fourth generation Canadian. We're more Canadian than most of the people that are asking us these mm -hmm. questions. And what do we know about the culture? I remember uh, when I was at university, I, was, I think I was looking for a job or something. And uh, my roommate came home one day with a, with a uh, job posting and he said, this one's perfect for you. And I sat down and I started reading it. And there was like qualifications that, that I had and some that I didn't. But the last one was uh, hiring a, a, a minority, a visible minority that you had to be. And I sat down and I started thinking, am I a visible minority? I wasn't quite sure. And in fact, if you asked me that today, I probably still couldn't answer that fully because I don't really consider myself a part of a visible minority. I always thought of myself pretty much as Canadian. I tried to see myself as more um, white or belonging to the rest of, uh, of my Canadian culture and being the same as everyone else at school. But I think they, a lot of my classmates saw me differently. And um, it wasn't until recently I've realized that, that people, that I'm not um, Canadian, as I've always thought. And the fact that I do look very Asian. I feel that uh, Kaneko's uh, name is, is, reflects her personality quite well. I don't think changing my name from uh, John Richard Wolfen Hada to Yoshi Hada or something would really uh, do that much for me. I think that I do look more Asian than my brother does. And so I think that that has um, prompted me to uh, respond um, maybe differently than my brother has. Where my brother can pass for white, um, I don't think that I have ever passed for white. I remember when we first moved into uh, this era, present area that we lived in, meeting a lot of people. And then it seemed that uh, when people found out that Kim was my sister, then they sort of viewed me differently because they didn't think I was Asian before that. And then they saw Kim and then they started getting all the, the bad 
jokes or little limericks or whatever about Chinese, Japanese or, or whatnot. I felt more acceptance when people didn't know that I was Asian. There is less ambiguity for the most socially conscious of the John children, Daniel. He seems the most content with his double-sided nature. He roams freely in both cultures, choosing the most attractive and useful bits of each. His idea of the Virgin Mary bridges the gaps in an imaginative and unselfconscious manner. It's a unified whole from two contrasting halves, the blue gown of the Christian tradition topped by a nose ring. Daniel has had the benefit of watching his sister and brother put their pieces of the puzzle together. He has a different way and it works for him. You've done a fine job here. Thank you. You're such a detailed man. Um, is this your idea of Mary and child? I'm, I'm pretty sure. You're pretty that's, sure? That's what you are. Okay. More so than like blonde and blue eyes. And you're, it's got an interesting combination there, Dan, in that she looks very Indian, but her skin is even whiter than mine. Well, that's like, because she was Jewish, so she wasn't like that dark skinned, I don't think, like Jewish people are. It's interesting you've put a nose ring, how come? Because in the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, it talks about nose rings. I think it was gave it to Rachel at the well, uh -huh. gave a nose ring. And also I read, I read books on it, like I looked it up to see whether that's what they would have worn, and they said, yeah, they wore nose rings, so I said to put a nose ring on. It shocks people, but, yeah. <laughs> that's half of your battle, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. Like, God and Mom don't freak out on you and do stuff like <laughs> that. Like, they understand, right? Yeah. Although Mom is like, well, not so much with the nose ring, but like, because of the big thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Indian stylistic trait. <laughs> it's not anything like Mom makes it out to be some kind of hideous, Thing. But anyway, <laughs> that's what Indian art is like. But anyway, it was. <laughs> I'm defending myself here. But anyway, um, she did get a. She just like when I made that picture of God with like many arms because like oh, yeah, it's, yeah. I, it's symbolic, right? And anyways, who says he doesn't? I mean, what is it? You'd say in the Bible, God only has two arms. <laughs> here, but, what? I think God's supposed to be a spirit, so it's yeah, really exactly. have a bodily think, shape, right? The point is, it's symbolic, and she was like, that's not the Christian <laughs> God at first, but then after a while, it's like, yeah. you know, Mom, she gets like that. Daniel's investigations have actually refocused his family's attention on his Indian history and culture. Daniel probably is the one that, that has, uh, has always had the most... Um, of a sense of um, uh, injustice, you could say, because, uh, and he's been the one most... You read the history books and people yeah. that are mm -hmm. put out to be heroes and that were racist, mm -hmm. right. whether it's against blacks or, or native people, they're racist and they're, they're heroes in one of the issues. Yeah, he's been very good, good at, at, at um, uh, you know, bringing that out. Now, he, he's done a lot of reading and all this sort of thing, so he knows the cultures, you see, mm -hmm. so he knows what these guys are talking about. Um, and, he, you know, he, he can bring that sort of stuff out. And one of, one of the things that he's done, I mean, right here at home, because, it, you know, some of my attitudes have been wrong, uh, and, and I, partly conscious, partly unconscious, you mm -hmm. know, because of course, I've been formed of the kind of education I got. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know that there was such a thing as African civilization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I really didn't, you know, uh, because it was never really mentioned as such. Daniel's investigation has sometimes made him angry, yet that anger is useful for his family. Daniel's anger and indignation ignite something in me. And, in, and he challenges Sunit, maybe even more than I do, or else Sunit, you know, just, it would just be Sunit's opinion. And so his anger and his, um, his good example of reading and finding out about that makes me angry too. And I think that's a good thing. Because when we get emotional, we'll do something, even if, even if that emotion just changes us. And then I'm more likely to speak out when I hear somebody say something, because I have some facts that he's taught me. So that's the good thing about our kids' anger. Mm -hmm. is they're not just angry against a particular incident or thing that's done, but they're, they're, he's even angry on behalf of people that are not dead. Hey, God doesn't really, sometimes he doesn't understand the way things are now, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And there were some things, like some things that I didn't understand. Like when I was a kid, um, I wanted to play with like ice hockey, right? Because all, all my friends were playing ice hockey. Yeah. And of course, I loved I liked hockey, I liked playing road hockey, so I wanted to play ice hockey. But he didn't put me in ice hockey because he wanted me to do figure skating first. And I tried to explain, <laughs> to, him, I tried to, explain to him how he does figure skating before they go to ice hockey, but he wouldn't believe me. I know, I thought So that's why I never got to play hockey, and it still like, ticked me off. <laughs> With me, like being a girl, you know, yeah. he, he he doesn't seem very Indian, so to speak, but he does have that yeah, background, like in terms of when I was a, you know, when I was growing up and stuff, wanting me to stay at home and be yeah. a good girl, and you know, why why would I even want to go out with my friends? He yeah. could never understand. He could just, just infuriate me. He could yeah. just never understand. No matter yeah. how many times I argued with him, cried, pleaded, begged, <sighs> why I would want to go out with my friends? Yeah. He just, I mean, now I'm old enough. He can't. You know, he can't stop me or anything. Maybe I treated Miriam as a girl differently from the boys and giving the boys more freedom uh, in going out and stuff like that. I, I was just as concerned in, in all cases that they approached that whole business of um, relations with the opposite sex from a Christian point of view and, and a biblical point of view, uh, that is should Considering the seriousness of their sex sexuality, it's not given for, um, uh, you know, casual foolishness. It's um, tied in with marriage, and it's intended to be very much a part of marriage, so that you're thinking in those terms, and I've always put that to them. Um, marrying into uh, another mixed race, uh, a, a different racial family, has probably been not so much about marrying somebody of color, but marrying somebody who comes from uh, a whole different culture. And in Sunit's case, it wasn't just that he was coming from an Indian culture with different long, generations long understanding of male and female roles that was difficult. But Sunit is, a, is an Indian Christian and a, 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 a believing Christian family. Their parents' Christianity is another layer of culture their children must integrate into their personality. Their lives are different, and their father's response to the kind of racism they encounter outside their home may prove to be of little help to them. In a racially tense world, it may be too yielding or too passive. Uh, as a Christian parent, uh, as a parent, period, is that, is that my children ultimately, in, in, you know, and honestly, not, uh, not with the pretend thing, you know, not sort of uh, ignoring the racism and the racist problems and all that, you know. Uh, but uh, responding ultimately with love for their enemies, you see, that is, that is the thing that I most, I would be most proud of with my kids, if they love their enemies. They, they challenge you all the time, even when you, when you begin, yeah. when Sneet begins glad. talking this way, you know, they'll say, but Dad, you know, don't give us all this theory. This is the situation that we're dealing with yeah. right now. Yeah. They want, sometimes they just want you to hear them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, yeah. you don't have an answer for them, mm -hmm. you know? But I think the one good thing about a home is, is we can't change some of the things that they'll be up against, and I don't even know the answers to them. But at home, this should be a place where they can challenge us, mm -hmm. where they can talk, where we're going to listen, mm -hmm. where we're going to be willing to change and uh, let them change yeah. us. And I think to sometimes to admit, like you said, I don't have the answers. No. To be able to say, yeah. I, I am, you know, powerless in this situation. I think that has some really... <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. still living in 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's like a coconut. He's brown on the outside, but white on the inside. <laughs> uh, I, I think in some ways, yes, I, I've become more white on the inside. Um, partly through university experience and, you know, I, um, I, because of my background in India where I've already become uh, westernized or whatever, I don't know what term to use, and colonialized or whatever. Um, I had a lot of English stuff, you know, to my education in, in my school in India and stuff like that, already in me. Um, and when I came here, my orientation was uh, European. Uh, you know, Dan uh, likes to say that, um, you know, my family is just too Eurocentric. But even now, though, when I, if you ever, like, if I ever have a problem or something, or I need advice. I don't go talk mm -hmm. to dad. I, I just assume that dad's always right. <laughs> so whatever he tells me must be right then, right? So I just go to dad. I know. I, I know. always knew that dad could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs>
The racial histories of Canadian communities are all different, but the World War II internment of Japanese Canadians adds unique drama to the Hutta family history. It's, it's clear that the internment has made our experience really quite unique. Um, in contrast to other mixed people, mm -hmm. uh, because when, when, when our fathers were growing up in St. Catharines, the Port de Luzi area, there were no other Japanese families mm -hmm. around. So I think that some other cultural groups may have you know, stayed with their cultural group. But for us, it really is. Like race and culture, they are separate things. It's very, it's separate. very Canadian culture. Yeah, for our fathers, they were, uh, they were forced almost <clears throat> to assimilate into the Canadian culture. My father, um, tr everything he did was to, to be, you know, um, to be a part of the Canadian culture. And uh, he, I don't ever remember hearing stories about, uh, about uh, his family doing uh, sort of Japanese, having Japanese customs. They tried very much to, to adopt the Canadian culture. Our father fit in was through things like sports. I was just going to say yeah. that. Yeah, my dad too. Yeah. He was really big into football, playing hockey. Playing hockey. <laughs> the Canadian star. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen that picture before, sir? Huh? Oh, no, I haven't. This is weird. Yeah. No, Strategies to deal with racism can define families because the parents are incapable of seeing their children as different and cannot understand why anyone would think otherwise. Being at the store one time, and I had you and Mike with me, and um, like to me, you don't look any different than, than me. And the lady asked me whose kids they were, and we're getting really, they're my kids. Well, they don't look like you. They certainly do. <laughs> but, you, know, you were very young, you wouldn't remember that, but I remember being really angry and, and upset that they, she would think I, they were somebody else's kids. But to me, you look just like me. Because I don't think of you guys as Japanese. That doesn't really, when we were talking about it, that I think, oh yeah, right, that, but to me you're just Sarah and Ron, that's, that's it. When my friends say that, or many of my acquaintances say that, it's actually hard for me to believe them. I don't, really? mean, that, I don't mean that in a negative way, but it just, I can't believe that they could say, I don't think of you as being happy, I mean, you know, you're looking at me, you know. What, it, what is it that you're looking at if exactly. you don't think of me as being a little bit different? Well, every time I meet someone, the first question they ask is, you know, what's your background? I didn't realize that you were asked that question all the time. It didn't even no, to it's me. something that happens um, every time I meet someone new, just about. You know, somewhere in the conversation it will come up of where you're from and, and then what's your background will lead into that question. I guess because I'm not of a racial minority or not really, I wouldn't, I'd never even thought of that. You never mentioned it before. I think my father was always taught to ignore the person who's making a racist comment and to ignore the behavior. And so my mother picked up on that. In a way, I wish that they had both dealt with it in a more um, direct way and had taught my brother and I how to speak back in a way that the person would realize what they had said was extremely offensive to us. And perhaps they would learn from it. Even if they didn't, at least we would feel better about it. But to bottle that up and not to be able to react to someone when they've made comments like that, it's upsetting. And when it happens, you know, time and time again, it really builds up and it becomes an issue. And I think it's not until now, some, you know, 10, 15 years later, that I've been able to deal with those, that, that pain. I'm very critical when I see uh, people of different races or different backgrounds coming together. I'm very, very critical of it. I just want to know why. It's a nice thing to say we're in love, or love is going to conquer all, or, you know, who cares what people think, you know, they're closed-minded. The reality is we're living in a racist world, and you're going to have to deal with racism. And you may want to shut your ears to it and lock yourself away in a bubble, but your kids won't be able to do that. They're going to have to go out in the world and go to school and deal, deal with these issues. And if you don't want to deal with it, they're going to have to deal with it on their own, which is very, very difficult. This is the heaviest burden carried by mixed-race children to steer their way pretty much on their own. Their parents, having taken a step to transcend racism by marrying each other, often assume that their acts and similar acts will eventually kill the racism around them. One thing that, that really disturbs me too when about children coming out of this relationship is that um, Sometimes the parents have this idea that the children are going to save the world, they're going to conquer racism because you have these mm -hmm. two races coming together and this child, this child is a sort of blessed event and, and is going to unify. Um, like that's a terrible pressure to put a child under. Uh, 
and, and it's very erroneous. I mean, you can't expect racism to end because people are mating together. I mean, this has been going on for centuries. It's just, it's been going on for centuries. It hasn't changed a damn thing. If you look at the Caribbean, it's been going on for 500 years. You know, a huge percentage of people in the Caribbean are mixed people. It hasn't changed anything. It hasn't changed color relations. That's been the story of my life. My whole life in Canada has been, where are you from? What are you? Mm -hmm. Is that your mother? Or my mother being asked, are they adopted? Um, you know, and then if you say, oh, I'm from Winnipeg, or I was born, oh no, where are you really from? Yeah. <laughs> right? No, where were you from before? Well, where's your, what's your nationality? I and mean, then it's just the constant rephrasing of this question, trying to place you somewhere other than here. You know, mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, that's why I, I'll just never really feel Canadian. And I, I don't really, mm -hmm. do, you know, I don't feel any great loss about that either. I'm not one of these people that say, oh, I feel so strongly about my Canadian identity. I don't. I just feel that, you know, this has never been home. And I think a big reason that has never been home is because I was never treated from very young as if this was, this was a place for me. Kimiko Hota, after all her similar searching on a few continents, has come to a different decision about her place and her identity. So, I traveled all over the world, I guess. I, I, it was, it's interesting that in Japan, people didn't identify me as Japanese, they identified me as Canadian. Um, in, a, in a country as well like Scotland, which is very homogenous and very white, um, I felt very conspicuous there. Uh, in India, I stuck out. Um, I, I stuck out when I lived in Switzerland, I stuck out there. Um, I had to travel all over the world to realize that the place where I probably feel the most comfortable, where I feel that I blend in the most and can just relax and be myself, is, is probably Canada and really the city Toronto. Um, to realize that I am multicultural, this, this is a good multicultural environment, and uh, I, I'm pretty happy here. The lives of mixed-race children are far more complex than most parents realize. Chaldia and Henderson may not even be aware that the opposition to their relationship is going to impact on the self-esteem and identity choices of their children. Mixed-race children experience racism not only within society at large, but also within their own families and communities. Shazia and Henderson may never be able to fully understand their children's experiences, but they need to become aware that their children will have different experiences from their own and will feel the pressure of a society that is obsessed with placing people in distinct racial categories.